Moshe Rabbeinu complains to Hashem, you sent me to take the Yidden out of Mitzrayim, and ever since I began the process, it's only gotten worse for them. To which Hashem responds and says, you know, Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov didn't ever question me in this particular way. Now, then of Pasha Shmois, in the beginning of Pasha Vaira, Rashi offers two different insights into what exactly that conversation between Moshe and Hashem was, and, and how it went. One, he attributes in this parish of Aira to Rabbi Seinu Doroshu, and the other one he says simply according to Pshat, which gives us effectively two perspectives on the entire process of the Avois and of Moshe and how they interacted through their physical experience and how they interacted through their soul's experience. It's a fascinating uh, concept for us to understand and unpack. Shengiret Filmol, Aschot Rashi, is the Cholorosh Mefarish Pshutei Shol Mikra, the Rebbe has noted many times that even though Rashi's primary occupation is to teach us the simple understanding of the Pesukim, nevertheless, don't think that there isn't more to the story. Rashi's interpretation includes many fascinating and mind-blowing insights on various levels of Torah, including even the so-called why in the esoteric part of Torah. The only thing is, it's not so easy to access. No, If you want to get to the deeper layers of Rashi's interpretation, the only way to do so is to first understand what Rashi is saying at a simplistic level. So with that in mind, let's ply through the different levels of the interpretation of this conversation between Moshe and Hashem. The beginning of our parasha, Rashi first explains the simple explanation. And he kept his covenant with them. Then is Rashi Mamshich. Rashi continues as follows. That our Chachamim explained the, the theme of these Psukim as a reference to something that was noted earlier, in other words, at the end of Pasha Shmois, Shama Moshe, where Moshe complained to Hashem, Loma Hare Oisa, why have you done bad to the Jewish people? So, in that context, we get to this week's parasha where Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu, Woe to those who have passed, those who are no longer here, no longer uh, with us. Hashem says, I could even complain about the loss, about the passing of the Ovois. Why? Because I, I revealed myself to them many, many times using the particular formula, Kel Shakai. And they never asked, What is your real name? Whereas you said back at the time of the burning bush, what's going to happen when the Jews ask me, what is Hashem's name? What should I tell them? So you asked the question that obviously did not, so to speak, dare to ask. And I upheld my covenant to them, which means, Look what happened. Avram Avinu was promised there at Israel, yet when he had to buy a burial plot for, for Sarah, he had to pay top dollar. And likewise, Yitzchak also had to fight with Avimelech over the, the wells that he had dug in his own property, the land that was promised by me to him. And Yaakov also had to pay a lot of money in order to buy a piece of land, as the Torah tells us. And they never questioned me. Yet you complained that I sent you on a shlichus and things have gone sour. On his missaim, and Rashi then, after quoting that, says, "Ena medrash misyashir v'achara mikra chule." Actually, the medrash doesn't really fit very neatly into the words of the pesukim. Okay, so what is the, uh, uh, Rashi telling us in Vaera that Hashem, so to speak, is complaining? You're not like the others who accepted things without question, and you're challenging me. Now we have a similar theme in Sefer Parsha Shmois. The end of Parsha Shmois from Pasuk Atos Sira Goimer, where after Hashem says, uh, after Moshe says to Hashem, "Loma hari oisa." Then Hashem says to him, now you'll see what I'm going to do to Parev. I said to enter from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, because if I flew in Lama Harios, that's the Epistus response to Moshe's Taina, why have you been bad to the Jews? Zot Rashi, Rashi says a similar thing there. Here, Harut Almi Doisai, you questioned, you doubted my attributes. Like Avram, Shalmati, like Yitzchak, 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 And you're not like Avram, Abinu, who I promised that Yitzchak would be his seed, his continuation of his legacy. And then I told him to go and offer Yitzchak as a sacrifice. And he never questioned. So we need to understand 
a few things, a whole lot of things we need to understand over here. Number one, Aleph, Avos, in Parshas Vaira, in a Pirish from Rabbi Seno, Del Shoah, now Ben Tashi from Rabbi Seno, Araya, as Allah Ovois, Lehirachami Doisai. How come it is here in our Parsha Vaira, Rashi quotes the Medrash, which describes how each of the Ovois didn't question Hashem? Whereas in Sef Parsha Shmois, Ben Tarai, no from Avram. Yet in the end of Parsha Shmois, he only quotes an example from Avram of in why the change. Bay, second, the Oichbenige Avram Gufa, the fact that he quotes that Avram Avinu trusted him, Zashi Bepasha sent him before Shiminyam for Lahir Acham Hidoisa, Mitanander Amuro. You see, he quotes Avram Avinu trusting in Hashem in Pasha Shmois and then gives a different example in Boera. Kishabikish Avram Nik Bere Sara, that Avram Avinu wanted to bury Sara. Vin Sef Pasha Shmois, Shamatel Kibitzki Kikar Chazara, a different example to what he used in Pasha Shmois where he said that I promised him a child called Yitzchak and then I told him to sacrifice his child. Gimel ve'ikar, and probably the most important thing we have to focus on is besoif pasha shmois brengt rashi dem pirish lo hira stam dos eisal zayin pirish pshutay shol mikra in pasha shmois rashi doesn't quote anybody he says you didn't Avraham Avinu didn't doubt me as if it's Rashi speaking as if he's explaining just simply the pshat mashenki be pasha seinu mit aschol of Rabbi seinu dorushu adrash whereas in our parasha vaera. He quotes a medrash and he insists that it's Dorashuhu, that it's at the level of drash, not of pshat. Not only that, but as that drash, Barashi's own admission, this particular drash doesn't really sit neatly in the words of the Pasuk. Which is weird because that's Hefecha Klal Berashi as when it brings down Agode is this Miyashevas Divra Mikra. That Rashi typically only ever quotes a Medrash in order to satisfy the meaning of the words in the Pasuk. And here he says it's the exact opposite. So that's very odd. Sometimes a question is the key to the answer. Shlomar as the let's the Duke find for Kolanel. That last question about how come it is that Rashi. In, in Shmois gives his own Shutoy Shal Mikra and in Vaira quotes a Medrash and then says the Medrash is not so simple, that actually holds the key to the answer. In Psev Pasha Shmois is Rashi Mephosh Pshutoy Shal Mikra Al Asar. At the end of Pasha Shmois, Rashi's objective was to explain the simple understanding of the conversation that happened between Hashem and Moshe Rabbeinu at that moment. Okay, Pshutoy is the Pasuk of Ayom Hashem and Moshe at the Sira Goimer and then for Kenal, if Tanas Moshe and Dipsukim Rifneze, Loma Hare Oisal Amaze, Goimer Meos Bossi, El Parle Dabish Mechahir Alamaze. The Pshat of the story is <coughs> Hashem is responding to Moshe. Now you will see what I'll do to Paroi because you asked, Why have things gone bad for the Jewish people since I came to speak to Paroi? Things have only gone worse. In other words, what's Moshe's complaint? Not only was his mission apparently unsuccessful because he hasn't yet saved the people. No, Adraba, it's gone the other way. Life has become worse for the people. On the far, Atosire, her Osso, the Paratire, Veloy, her Osso, in the Malchi Shiva, Shiva, Moshe. Therefore, Rashi says something fascinating there. Not only does Hashem tell Moshe Abenu, You'll see now what I'm going to do to Paroi. But he says, and this is all that you will get to see. You will not get to see what I do to the seven nations occupying Canaan. Because you questioned my attributes. Therefore, there is a consequence. You're not going to see the justice meted out on the nations of Canaan. And that, says Rashi, is neat vidyan hogadav zayn. That's not the way a person should behave in your connection to Hashem. Un is given benidin doime ba'avram. And Rashi says, it's not how in a similar situation a different tzaddik, Avram Avinu, behaved. He did not question. Even though he had the same kind of problem, Hashem says, as you, Moshe, have. Because I promised him one thing and then I seemed to undo it. I promised him a child, Yitzchak, who would continue his lineage. And then I suggested he should slaughter that child. Think about it. It's the promise that Yitzchak would be his descendant and his uh, flag bearer. That's what makes it so difficult when he's now told to shecht him. Very similar to what you're saying, Moshe, that if I hadn't promised you anything, you wouldn't be so bitter over the fact that life has gotten worse for them. But because I promised you salvation and now they're suffering, that's why you're so upset. You could see this in normal human experience. 
ist nicht bedeutet zu die Sören, was man hat, wenn der Bestand schon gebenscht mit der Benjochen, der lässt sich nur so. Und er wird dann noch zugenommen. Anybody will tell you that the, the pain of not having children does not compare to the pain of somebody who has a child after waiting many, many years and they're already older and it's a single child and then Nebuch HaChashon takes that child. Especially in the case of the Akedah, where it's not just that the Abishta would have taken Yitzchak, but Avram Abinu was charged with having to do it with his own hands. So you can see the similarity between <coughs> in Pshat, between Avram Abinu's experience and Moshe Abinu's complaint. Similar, you promised me something, now you're taking it away. And it's quite logical why at that point in the conversation Rashi would not have used the example of Avram Avinu having to pay money to bury Sarah. Or the example of Yitzchak having to fight over the wells or Yaakov having to buy the piece of land. Because none of those examples fit what Moshe is complaining about, where your promise is the source of the pain. The promise of Geula, go to Paroi, caused the increased slavery. So that's the cause of the pain. Your promise that Yitzchak is going to be the one who will continue the lineage of Avram Avinu, and now go and shecht him, that's what causes the pain. Whereas over here, it's just, how could it be? You promised me the land, and now I have to pay. It's the only thing Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov, when it came to buying land in Eretz Yisrael, could have thought about is, you promised me the land. So it shouldn't cost me. You promised me the land. In my mind, I shouldn't have to pay for it. Certainly not a lot of money. Similarly, Yitzchak shouldn't have to fight over the wells. Yaakov shouldn't have to lay out money for his land. It's a very different experience of whatever they may have doubted about Hashem to what Moshe had now challenged Hashem about. Moshe's complaint is, your shlichus caused the suffering. That's not what happened to Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov buying the land. So we get it why in Pasha Shmois, why um, Rashi only gave the example of Avraham, and why he only gave the example of Yitzchak and the Akeda, because that matches what, uh, what Moshe Rabbeinu was going through. So that fits the Pshat. But once you get into the drash, which is not just looking at that particular conversation, that not only that particular conversation with Moshe challenging Hashem, how could it be you sent me to Paris, things have gotten worse. But the entire flow right into our parasha where Hashem continues and says, and I appear to Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, Say the Medrash, say our Abhoi, that this is part of the conversation that began earlier at the end of Parsha Shmois. When in Atel from the Mabishan's Minor, Un is Atel from the Mabishan's Minor, when he gave the Shilas and the Burim by Yerun for Moshe Bechlal, and therefore the beginning of this Parsha is part of Hashem's response to Moshe's so called doubts or challenges. Not because of the additional pain of your promise is the problem. Just generally, how can you question Hashem? When you start to analyze the challenge that Moshe put to Hashem, they didn't start at the point where, uh, where Paroi increased the load on the Jewish people. It started right at the burning bush where he said, what's your name? What am I going to tell them? What are they going to say then? Now we understand at this point why Rashi says, okay, we need examples of all three of the others because they're referenced in the Psukim and they are references to how they didn't question Hashem at all because now, according to the Medrash, we're analyzing Moshe's complete overall approach to Hashem which includes questioning various things that Hashem had proposed, even the name that he's going to use. Okay, so we start to have a, a, a sense over here of what the difference is between Rashi's commentary in Shmois and in Vo'era. Oidia Shloimer. Let's take it further. Dostos Moshe Abeinot Gizot Lomer Oisalom Azeh Goimer is doch ni ta'in yin prati. Very important distinction between what Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov had to go through with their pieces of land versus Moshe Abeinu who's here not speaking on his behalf. It's not a personal thing. Vos is Menegetzi Malein, something that affects him as an individual. 
No, but Shaykh is La Mazet, a Kral Yisrael. Moshe Rabbeinu is speaking over here on behalf of the Yidna. He says, La Mahare Oysa La Amazet. Why have you done bad to them, not to me? Over Mela Kanashi and Derech Abshatni bring an Adugma from Avram, Bosatni Mahari give him Benegad the Maras Machpelo and Aderech Zephon Yitzchak by the Beiros. And for Yaakov, I can ask It would be completely inappropriate there to start quoting examples of how Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov didn't complain when they had personal sorrows. I have to pay money for Maras Machpelo? I have to fight over these wells? Because each of those examples affected them as individuals. And that would actually give us a good reason why they might not have questioned Hashem, because they might have rather questioned themselves and thought, you know what, maybe Hashem's promise is not going to be fulfilled. Because maybe we did something wrong and we lost the opportunity to have this promise given to us. And as we well know, that uh, Rashi already pointed this out, that Yaakov was afraid. So it wouldn't match, right? Because Mashen Kintanas Moshe was given a gear, Ras Klal Yisrael. Moshe is arguing on behalf of the entire Jewish people who are all suffering now. There's no way that Moshe could have done something wrong that would cause the people to suffer. So therefore, he has to challenge Hashem and say, "What's going on? You promised us that this is the beginning of the salvation, the emancipation of the Jewish people, and it's only caused us sorrows. How could that be?" Therefore, at the end of Pasha Shmois, where Rashi is talking the language of Pshat, how is the story of the conversation between Moshe and Hashem panning out? There he says, in Sefer Pasha Shmois, that you, Moshe, you are not behaving like Avram Avinu, where I promised him that Yitzchak would carry on his legacy, and then I told him to Shech Yitzchak. Because that's a story that's not just about Avram's personal experience. That's something that influences the entire future of humanity and certainly of the Jewish people. Which is why Avram Avinu could not have said, okay, you know what, maybe Hashem changed his mind because I did something wrong. How could you say that? How could you do something wrong that's going to affect the whole of history? Yet Avram Avinu didn't ask any questions or challenge Hashem. Whereas you don't find such a story in the lives of either Yitzchak and Yaakov. So that explains us why in Parsha Shmois, where Moshe challenges Hashem and Hashem pushes back and says, Ato sire, Rashi says, you, you didn't behave like Avram Avinu. He had the same argument that you could have had you promised me something your promise is now blowing up in my face and it doesn't just affect me it affects other people so i cannot just say maybe i don't deserve it anymore that would fit the pshat and now at this point in the Sikha, we're going to make a very important shift, which will play through to the through the whole Sikha. The minute you add you, you enter the world of Medrash, of Drush, you're already talking about more spiritual perspectives. The Roy Sedas Atira Gunuzin Ba, as we know very well, inside the Medrash, the Agadic part of Torah, are all the great secrets of Torah. So once you're looking from the perspective of Nishmosa Dairaisa, you say, Whoa, hang on a second. Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov are not ordinary citizens. They are vehicles of unadulterated godliness. Even as they live here on earth, they live with the same kind of absolute dedication to Hashem, complete transparency, Hashem shines right through them as if they were in Shammai. So you cannot really say, looking from the, the prism of Nishmosa Deiraisa, you cannot say that these are people who could have been contaminated by sin. So actually, if you're talking about people who never really have to contend with Shema Gorem Achet, then it doesn't matter if the incident in their lives affects the community or only affects them. Either way, they wouldn't question Hashem. They, they would never question Hashem, even if they had a reason to question Hashem. The three examples. Because they were, in the words of the Alter Rebbe, complete vehicles for Hashem's will at all times 
24-7, 365, their entire lives, that's it. So, if I'm looking from a perspective of pshat, as Rashi does at the end of Pasha Shmois, okay, if it was a personal story, perhaps I have to look inward instead of challenging Hashem and say, what did I do to mess up? So the only appropriate example to use to compare to Moshe is Avram of where Hashem promised him something that would affect generations and then seemed to take it away from him. Whereas if I'm looking from the perspective of Nishmasa Doiraisa, where I recognize that these are the highest, greatest Sadikim of all time, they are a Merkava, a vehicle for godliness, and therefore there is no way that they could ever have reflected inwards and said, we sinned, and therefore we lost an opportunity. So if they don't challenge Hashem for taking away His promise, you promised me the land and I'm paying for it, or fighting with Avimelech, or whatever the case is, that tells us that they had absolute trust in Hashem. It wasn't because they may have analyzed that I don't deserve it anymore because they could never have reached a point of not deserving it anymore. So from Yenya Shotel and then Pir Shashi, now let's take this a little deeper. So you're going to see now a link between the two different explanations that Rashi gives to two different perspectives on the entire story of Hirach Amidois. It's a fascinating concept that, Rebbe, that the Rebbe explains in a sicha um, much earlier. That when we talk about Maisa Ovois, we talk about the, how Maisa Ovois is bonim, that the stories of our forefathers are indicators of what will happen and also empower us to go through what will happen in our spiritual journeys. As in Demzan and Svei Fanim, there are two angles of how Maisa Ovois happens. And this is fascinating stuff. They're the stories as the stories played out in the physical reality, the physical human beings called Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Zohar, Rivka, Rochel, and Leah, and the experiences that they had as human beings. On the day of Shaykh, Avram, Zohar, Daigin, Hashem, Kibalti, Zohar, Al Tzitkusi, as Zohar, Betna, Nosa, and Yerusha, Zohar, it's Zohar, Derech, Zohar, Yaakov. So if you're looking from the so-called human perspective, when Avram Avinu looks through his human eyes, he says, maybe Hashem has already rewarded me for all of my righteousness, and I no longer deserve uh, to, to get Eretz Yisrael, so I need a proof. Or Yaakov Avinu says, maybe I've done something wrong that I've lost Hashem's protection. That's when you look through human eyes. Like the story of the Mezitcha Magid, which incidentally is a story the Alter Rebbe conveyed to the Tzemach Tzedek just before his Histalkus, which is, of course, this week of Dalatevas. So the Mezitcha Magid says he saw Moshe Rabbeinu learning with children the Pasuk, which is, that, he, that Avram Avinu, so to speak, fell down and laughed when he heard and he, that he was going to have a child. And he said, me, 100 years old, Sora, 90 years old. And, and Moshe Rabbeinu explains that that means literally he laughed. Why? Because there's a human perspective. There's the capacity of these great Sadikin to look through human eyes which also brings certain human limitations. Of course, those limitations don't really limit the tzaddikim, but they have experiences that are, in a sense, similar to our experiences, and he laughs. On the other hand, there's Then there's the real experience of Maiseovus, the way they experience it from the perspective of the very lofty Nishamas. At which point it's not even shaykh that they could ask any questions or doubt Hashem. Okay, so there are two possible perspectives. There's Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov looking through human eyes which could raise questions in their minds or cause them to laugh or doubt or question. And how they look through their neshamas where it's absolutely whatever Hashem says is immutable. So here's where it gets really interesting. You could use this as a klal, as a general rule. When Rashi explains the pshat of psukim, then Rashi is describing the experience of life of Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov from the perspective of the human body. Whereas the minute you enter the world of Drush, Medrash, etc., then you're analyzing the experience of the Ovos, etc., as it was from the perspective of the Neshamas, which obviously is their real reality. We can apply that to our story of Moshe Rabbeinu too. 
the end of Pasha Shvois, Rashi analyzes the conversation between Moshe and Hashem from a Pshat perspective, which means the entire story through the lens of the human experience. So the, as long as we're looking through the human lens, we cannot bring a proof against Moshe to say, why did you question from a story that applied to Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov in their personal lives? Because it's possible that in their personal lives, looking through the lens of the human experience, they may have had self-doubt. They may have believed that they had somehow lost the opportunity for the bracha. But when you switch lenses and now you're looking through the Medrash perspective, you're looking through Agada where all the secrets of Torah are hidden. Then you're looking from the lens of the Neshama. From the lens of the Neshama, they are perfect vehicles for godliness. They could never have sinned. They could never have lost the opportunity for the brocha. So therefore, if Hashem tells them you're getting the land and then makes them pay for it, they have every right to question and say, why would we have to pay for what you've promised us? But they don't. Proof that they didn't in any way question Hashem. We can apply the same logic and understanding to Moshe's interaction with Hashem. At the end of Pasha Shmois, when we analyze how Moshe says, why have you caused so much distress to these people? And since I came to Paroi, it's only got it worse from them. If you're looking from the Pshat expression, that's looking through the human experience lens. So looking through the human lens, it sounds like Moshe Rabbeinu is actually complaining to the extent that Hashem almost, so to speak, regrets having appointed him as the one to lead the mission. From the human lens, it looks like a, an argument complaint to Hashem. And the complaint is, your shlichus you've given me is the direct cause of pain to the Jews. Now, if you're looking through the human lens, then you're looking at Moshe complaining to Hashem. Then there's a consequence. Because if there's a lack of absolute dedication and faith, then there's a consequence, which is you're not going to see what happens in Canaan. Whereas in Parshas Vaero, when you start to look now through the lens of Nishmasa Doiraisa, which means you're looking from how Moshe Rabbeinu's Neshama processed this interaction. Then you can no longer say that Hashem accused Moshe of actually doubting him. And that therefore Moshe should deserve a consequence. So what then was Moshe complaining about? In Parashas Va'era, Rashi quotes the Medrash saying, What was Hashem's complaint to Moshe? Why are you dissatisfied with the revelation of Kel Shakai? And you're asking me, what is my name? In other words, what was Moshe's taina? I want to know more. I want to experience more. I want to reveal more godliness in the world. So share the shame hamafoyrosh. In other words, he was pushing to be able to know the truth of Hashem, the essence of Hashem, a higher dimension of godliness. I, he used the words, why have you done bad to these people? That's not a doubt or a questioning of Hashem's attributes or methodology. So what is it? Instead, what he wanted to do, what Moshe wanted to do, was not just to accept at face value out of commitment that I have to do what I have to do and the Abish is going to take care of the rest. I want to understand it. I want to relate to it. I want to appreciate it. 
which by the way is why in Parsha Shmois when Rashi was explaining the simplest understanding of the Psukim he does use the expression that Moshe questioned Hashem whereas in Vo'era when he quotes the Medrash he doesn't use that expression because it's not questioning Hashem it's trying to make sense in human terms of what Hashem is saying now, Mikhail Chalts Fregen, you could still ask. Even according to the first interpretation, which is we're looking at Moshe's life through the lens of human experience, how even then can we suggest that Moshe doubts or questions Hashem? Who are we talking about? We're talking about Moshe Rabbeinu, not some average person. We know that from the moment he was born, there was already something special about him. There was this aura that, con- that filled the entire house with spiritual light. And then not only do you say that Moshe had questions, but you highlight that Avois didn't have questions. And Moshe, who is the choicest human being, the most elite human that exists, even greater than Avois, did have questions. Why would you say that? And continuing on the same theme, why are we looking to highlight something negative about Moshe Rabbeinu? As the, as the Gemara clearly tells us in Parashas Noyach that the Torah avoids even speaking negatively about a non-kosher animal. So therefore, for sure, with regards to a Jew, not just any Jew, the Torah is not going to speak negatively. And Kavos to tell Torah as, as Moshe here, here am I doing? Say, why would the Torah even go down this road? Why would the Torah even suggest, even if it's not literal? Why do you even open the possibility of something thinking that Moshe challenges or asks Hashem? Vos fara heiro is doing them for Eden, but also the coin. What could this possibly teach us about how we should serve Hashem? It would be pretty far-fetched to say the Torah wants to warn you just how careful you need to be to never question Hashem. And that we should be like Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov and never question anything. Because if it is true that even Moshe Rabbeinu couldn't, so to speak, withhold asking questions, how do you expect it of me? So why is the Torah even going down this route? It seems to make no sense. Moshe Rabbeinu should have been the person who you would last expect to ask anything of Hashem. Let's first address a very well-known and pretty glaring question, which is at the beginning of the parasha, where Moshe, uh, sorry, where, where Rashi tells us the pasuk says, "Vaera says Rashi El Ha'Avos, I appear to the office." Well-known question. All the commentators ask it. The pasuk is immediately going to tell us Vaera to who. The Pasuk says, So what's Rashi helping us to understand by saying, oh, it's, if the Pasuk already tells us, it's the others. Is that the them? The explanation is Rashi's demotation to Mazbrezain as the Indian Vilui von Vera, Lavrom Gamer, Ia in Elikus, Bevados, and Muxis, Vidvados, Shalderi, Ia Gashmis. What's Rashi telling us over here? Vera means you see something, it means it's real to you. It means this is a revelation of godliness that is going to be so clear, so, uh, so, so apparent, so absolute. As if you see and seen something with your own physical eyes, was der far is by zeni given shaykhirachamidosai. That's the experience of Ram Yitzchok and Yaakov had. They had such clarity about it. Of course, that's why they never asked any questions. Says Rashi, why did they have that? Haben sie gehabt als obvious von dem bnei Yisrael. They were given that kind of clarity because they needed to be the forebears of the Jewish people. So 
In other words, what's Rashi telling us over here? That the Ebeshter designed Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov to have such absolute clarity in godliness. Why? Because they needed to be our ancestors. And we will we'll inherit certain things from them. Like the Mishnah tells us, you could uh, inherit good looks. You could uh, inherit wisdom from your parents. So in this case, we inherit clarity. From the passion in the Indian as Enkar and Oves Elalishloisha, like the Altareb explains in this week's Torah, or why is it that only Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov are called Oves and nobody else? As Bechino is Oves, he rushed the Nemachim Bechol Torah, Bechino Savas Tsarich is Bechol Adam. That what's unique about the Oves, unlike, for example, the Shvatim, is that every single one of us must have within us components of each of the Oves. So that tells us something. That tells us why it is that Hashem, according to the, the, the Medrash, that Hashem says, I'm, I, I feel like I've lost. I, I wish I had them back. The Ovois. Because the clarity about godliness that Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov experienced was by virtue of the fact that they would be the grandparents of the Jewish nation. So once we know that Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov have that in their spiritual DNA, that is immediately a reason to say, so new, why are you not living up to it? They passed it on to you in your spiritual DNA. You should equally have the the, the capacity not to question what I say. Okay, perhaps we could argue as follows. We can make the following distinction. Yes, of course, a father bequeaths certain things to a child. Literally, heredity. We could also understand that very often a child will have something in in a lesser version than how the parent had it. It will be kind of watered down by the time it reaches the child. So if that's the case, we could offer an excuse. That by the time you're a couple of generations down, the experience, the revelation of godliness that you have is not as deep and powerful and profound and compelling as it was in the patriarchs themselves. And that's something Rashi alludes to when he says, I appear to the Ovis. The ganze Giloi von Voera is given to the Ovis. That incredible revelation of godliness was presented to the Ovois. He's telling us something very important over here. Hashem didn't reveal himself to Avram Yitzchak Yaakov because they achieved something through their Avoida. Avram Oyavin Kav Ahava, because Avram had excelled so amazing in Avas Hashem. Pachad Yitzchak Bekava Gvura Bechule, because Yitzchak Avinu had excelled so amazingly in the concept of Gvura and Yiras Hashem. This is what Rashi wants us to know. Why is there such an incredible revelation of godliness to these people? Because they're of voice. Because they have a responsibility to transmit and transfer this awareness to their descendants who, who inherit everything. And because the revelation, the awareness of godliness was shared with these Avais for the benefit of their children, therefore you cannot tell me that by the time the children experience it, it is no longer the same awareness. The only time a parent could have greatness that the child does not necessarily replicate is when they work to achieve their greatness by effort. What they do to serve Hashem, etc. Even though we know, as the Mishnah told us, those are things that you can transmit and transfer to your children. 
Can it be said by Meirish? Not if it's a hey chedarga. We buy Meirish, but because the person worked on it, what the child will inherit is not necessarily going to be the same as what they had through their efforts. Mashen can be indeed done. That's not relevant in our discussion over here about the avoys. Vos de ilui fun vo era kodesh borchum itzad atzmo is to avoys. What's happening over here? Hashem reveals Himself to Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov because they are avoys. Vos dem teyarum etzias machtuf dem ben. The concept of being a father is that you are the one who produces the child. Is moven as the ilui commercial by moav kum pirusha to the kinder, which means it's embedded in their spiritual. DNA. It is not something of their making. It is not something of their efforts. It's not something of their achievements. It's part of who they are. And the DNA is transmitted absolutely from one to the next, which means that the child could and should and does have the same capacity for awareness of Hashem as the father had. So that only raises the question. If every single one of us, and certainly Moshe Rabbeinu, has inherited in our blood this incredible awareness of Hashem, how then could that not stop Moshe Rabbeinu questioning Hashem? The answer is The Medrash tells us that the Pasuk says they, they believed what Moshe told them that they're going to leave Mitzrayim and that was the schus that got them out. Their faith got them out of Mitzrayim. Now faith is an interesting thing. It has many layers to it. What does it mean they had this absolute faith? It means that they came in touch with the essence of their Jewish being, which is so deeply connected to Hashem that naturally you trust and believe in Hashem. And because they were in touch with that deep part of their own Nishama, that's why they deserve to leave Mitzrayim. Now you're going to say, what's the first time people had a Munah? Even while they were slaves for 210 years, they still also had faith then. So how come they weren't taken out of Mitzrayim then? That emuna that they had was ma'aminim b'nei ma'aminim, a product of who their parents were. That was a yerusha. It's what you got from your parents. B'nei ma'aminim. Doesn't matter who you are, what you're going through, what you're experiencing. It's part of you. But as individuals through their own experience, their own growth, their own efforts, they had not yet completely digested emuna. In other words, they had emuna because that's how they were brought up, not because it was something they had come to resonate with of their own depth of experience. So to get them out of Mitzrayim, not just as a gift because you belong to this great chain of believers, but because you have worked to believe, that they should deserve and earn Yitzias Mitzrayim. Something had a change. It could no longer just be their muna passed down through the generations that overwhelmed them. It had to become theirs. It had to become something that they felt, something that they experienced, something that they owned. That's what Moshe did. That's Moshe's job. Therein lies the massive difference between the spiritual input from Avram, Yitzchok, and Yaakov and the spiritual input from Moshe Rabbeinu. As we already described, the Avois, that's their job. Avois. Avois means that they are our ancestors. They're our parents. That means that they bequeath to us, they share with us genetically, hereditarily. They share certain components, become part of who we are. Which means born into this family, a descendant of Avram Yitzchok Yaakov, you have faith. It's almost like an occupational hazard. You have it whether you like it or not. 
But Moshe changes the whole experience. Besides the fact that Moshe Rabbeinu belongs to the generic category of seven major shepherds who help to imbue holiness and awareness of God into every Jewish soul. As we well know, he is the ultimate shepherd. He incorporates all the other Shiva Royim within him. He is the ultimate one who is able Raya Mehemna to get Emuna to become real to you. So therefore, Er is on as the Emuna was is do Baidin so sein Emuna be beginnes Pinimius. Moshe is the one who can get emuna, which very often is an abstract, ethereal concept, to become so real to the people. It should be complete, powerful, and deep, deep emuna. To the extent that the emuna now completely overwhelms and overtakes the whole person, changes who you are, and naturally then what you do. That's Moshe's job. The Avas did a magnificent job of embedding Emuna within us. Moshe's job is to nurture it till we take it as our own. Now we can really understand what Moshe was doing when he so-called asked Hashem, why have you done bad to the Jewish people? Why the Torah would tell us something? It's not because it wants to malign Moshe chas and say, look, Avraham Abinu doesn't ask questions, and you do. And we'll also now understand Hashem's response in a completely different way. Now we're already at the point in the story where they're close to the Gula. And therefore Moshe arrives as Hashem's agent to take the Yidin out of Mitzrayim. They had reached a point where it was now critical that the faith that the Yidden had would no longer just be a pass, a hand-me-down from a previous generation, from Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. It had to be this. It had to fill their whole being. It had to be real to them. That you could only resolve by Moshe Rabbeinu, so to speak, tackling Hashem with all these questions. What's going on over here? You sent me, it's gotten worse, etc. The response to Moshe's question is, Moshe Rabbeinu challenging Hashem evokes the Vo'era so that every Jew can see with the clarity that previously only Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov had. Moshe Rabbeinu is tackling Jews who are at a level where they probably do have questions and doubts. He's speaking in their voice when he says, Because these are the questions they have. And he wants to transform them into people who va'era, that they can actually see. That they should have absolute faith and therefore no possibility for questions. That's why at the end of Pasha Shmois, what does Rashi say? Moshe Rabbeinu, you questioned my motives. And you were unlike Avram Avinu, who never had such questions. What's Rashi alluding to? That to have a loy hearer because of Avram Avinu, because Avram Avinu inspired you, affected you, was mashpi on you, and therefore you have no questions, it's actually not good enough. Because we know who you really are. You really do actually have questions. Because you've inherited the faith, but you've also got your own brain. You are an individual. You inherited this incredible emuna, but you also have your own questions. 
Und der Uftuch von Moshe ist gewähnt, als ich hatte hier hart, dass er kein Ort nicht haben durch die Baraka des Baruch und Gilead von Vaira Kanal. Moshe Rabbeinu's incredible impact is to tackle those individuals who in spite of the Yerusha from their forefathers, they have faith, but they also have questions. Moshe works with them. Let's address your questions. Let's clarify things to a point of Vaira till those questions no longer exist. Dem ist noch immer durch der Einteilung von der Pirushim in Pirushashi, hat der Rapshat, wie sie Pasha Schmoyf, und hat Pirab ist im Dorsch über Pasha Sena. Das gibt uns eine viel mehr beautiful Insight into how Rashi addresses the issue in two different ways in two different places. End of Pasha Schmoyf from the perspective of Pshat, and in Pasha's favor from the perspective of Drush. Das, was ist mir wohl die Ehre, als die Pirushim hat der Rapshat mit Pirushashi seine Videonen mit seinem Zad der Guff. Remember, we said earlier in the Sicha that when Rashi explains things according to Pshat, he's explaining the perspective through the human experience of the Tzadikim, the Ovois, Moshe Rabbeinu, etc. And <clears throat> is not the Pshat, so, so when we explain that, is not the Pshat as Mitzad Gufa Shal Moshe, is Shaykh Anyun from Nirhata Midoisa Kipshuta Chasvishon. Now, we could make a mistake and think, okay, so, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu also has a human element. And just like I have questions, Moshe also said, no, he doesn't have questions in the way that you and I experience questions. For the very fact that from birth he was absolutely good and generating this incredible spiritual light tells you there's no way he had questions like you and I have questions. But the Pirish Bose is rather what it means is as the in Ved Giton and Ephim Bose Ken and Pashas Vachetan is Gitaj Venve here of a hot head kipshutai. It means that there's a certain approach that Moshe Rabbeinu takes that if you're superficial and you don't really understand what's going on, you'll see in that approach as if he's asking questions. On the river. If I'm looking from the Pshat perspective, Gufa Torah, the more, so to speak, finite perspective of Torah, which is Torah talking to me in my experience. I read the Torah through my lens and I say, I have questions. Moshe probably also had questions. Why would the Torah even do that? Why would the Torah even propose a possibility that Moshe had questions so I could relate to it and feel it? You know what? I also have questions. Why? Only to open a path to get me to that clarity. Even if I'm that kind of a Jew who currently my body gets in the way of my neshama. Which means my inherited emuna from Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov unfortunately is not my guiding light and principle in life. And maybe from the perspective of my physical self, my physical brain, my rational thinking, I have questions, real questions. Power because Moshe Rabbeinu incorporates the whole of the, every Jewish person within his neshama. Moshe can affect even that person, the Giloy Fun Vo'era, absolute clarity. The Giloy His Amtus Viskashe Shal Demuna Shlil Fun Demir Veipachal Hero, to be able to have such absolute clarity in the same person who a minute ago had all these questions. Total clarity, lack of questions, absolute acceptance of what Hashem has, and not because I'm blind, to the contrary, because I can see. Whereas, when you look through the lens of the Medrash, which is to start with from a spiritual perspective, that immediately shows how every single Jew, the Neshama, is alive, and therefore nobody could really actually have any questions. It's not that I have questions that challenge, I have questions to learn. I want to incorporate this into the mind so the mind can also appreciate what's going on over here. And that's Moshe Rabbeinu's incredible impact that it's possible for people to reach a point where that which is fundamentally beyond the intellect could be understood by the intellect. So according to the Pshat, it's saying we know that some people still have questions. Moshe Rabbeinu will work you through that and get you to a point of absolute emunah vo'era. According to the Shmosa Daraisa, every Neshama has no questions, but there are certain things we go through in a questioning fashion so that we can bring that which is totally super rational into the space of the rational to, to uplift it as well. 
הפי הנ"ל ואת מפשטן כשייכס מחוף דלת תבס ימי לא לפנות מרבן זה פרשה סבו אירו and now we can see a very interesting link between בו אירו and אל תרבס יורצייט אחרי דברי השלו הידועים as השלו clearly says there's always a link between special dates and the parashas where they fall ואז בשון הזה בי בכמה וכמה שונים יש אסכל אין דבו חפון פרשה סבו אירו this year as is often the case חוף דלת תבס is in the week of בו אירו the Chiddush von Teres Chassidus Chabad, was is his Galig Vorn durch the Malton Rebben, the big revolution of Chabad Chassidus, which the Alter Rebbe taught and revealed, was by him a Yilul Zayn and Eilu Kol Maisev et Yerosev Avidosa She'ovad Kol Yemei Chayov. Obviously a day of a Yorzad is the day that all the efforts of the individual are elevated to the highest level. And it's done with Galim Eber Vchines Gilim El Maila Lamata, which causes a revelation, meaning to say a, a tangible experience of their teachings for us down here. So what's the great revolution of Chassidus Chabad? If Teres Chassidus Vizis Niskali Givon Durchem Baal Shem Tov and Mezich and Magid. Compared to the general Chassidus of the Baal Shem Tov, the Magid of Mezich. Yesh Loima. As Einin Vosei is, as a system Vos Yisparnus and Mine. One of the big differences is the concept of completely satisfying yourself. Providing for yourself a meaningful insight into Teres. From Pnimei Satera. On die Emunah in the course of the Neskala Duch Teres Chassidus Chabad, we find ourselves through them the Ganzen Menschen. So the kind of Emunah that we've been discussing, that is the inheritance from Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov, and then made into HD reality for us through Moshe Rabbeinu, that's the job of Chassidus Chabad. Oh no, I'm a dig from Meichen Shabbat. Chabad. How do you do this? First, you engage your mind, the the facets of intellect. Till you reach the point that it's not just like a, some kind of kernel of awareness of faith that every one of us has deep down somewhere inside of ourselves. But rather it should become something which is really real to you, something that you've worked through, that it takes on a three-dimensional reality. And that's what Chabad Chassidus does. It offers this opportunity to people who were nowhere near to having this kind of spiritual awareness or access. This is what the Alter Rebbe achieved by taking Chassidus, which is this powerful, very deep part of Elikus, and making it accessible in the human mind. To the point that it could even influence that which seems to be physically external to, to the world of holiness, to the world of neshamas. And to the part of the world or the part of the human which by nature interferes with and blurs godliness. And just like we see through Moshe Rabbeinu going through that process of asking the questions, why have you done things that are bad for the Yidin? What did he do through that? Moshe Rabbeinu, through asking the questions, having the rational conversation, opened people's eyes that they were able to then take the Semuna, which was so abstract, and make it real for them. That's what Chassidus Chabad does. Just like it was in Mitzrayim, how did we get out of Mitzrayim in the merit of our absolute faith in Hashem's promise? The same thing will happen with the coming of Moshiach. By spreading the wellsprings of Hasidus to the furthest reaches, where the Emunah will become something that actually keeps us alive, that fills us completely, that is meaningful and real to us. Which is achieved through the teachings of Hasidus Chabad. Until we actually affect that which is the most distant from, from holiness. That's what's going to bring Mashiach to Malka Mashiach. As all Eden and Yedi Eden, when the Zeichah says to Gula, Amitav Vashlemi b'Meheru v'Yameinu Mamash, that every single one of us will please God be able to experience the Geula Amitiv Vashlema immediately now.